it's important for us to have context for our lives. And uh, this is where we're going. There will come a day when we will stand before the throne of God on that crystal sea. There's another place in Revelation that says that sea is mixed with fire. But it's also mixed with healing. It flows from the throne of God. And there's healing and there's restoration. And there will be a day when people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue, we will stand together. We won't just see Jesus. We'll see each other. We will be overwhelmed when... Our faith is made sight. We will be overwhelmed when nothing at all separates us. And we will stand before him, recognizing him, understanding him. There will be new bodies. We will be clothed in, in victorious raiment, garments. Paul says that shines like the sun. We will be transformed as we stand before him. And, and, and this is where we are heading. This is where this thing ends. And so often today, we don't live within that context. You know, we don't talk about heaven very much. And when we do, we, we kind of think of heaven in very, very vague terms. You know, when we think about heaven, we think about being given a harp and floating around on a cloud and, you know, maybe singing kumbaya here and there. And, you know, when some kind of ethereal, heavenly type bliss without really understanding really what God has prepared for us. And God has prepared so much for us. And that's the direction that we are heading. And there are so many scriptures that talk about what's going to happen. And, you know, I don't have time to, to go into all the eschatological details. And I'm not doing an end time teaching here. But it is important. And I'm just going to throw out a number of scriptures to you that if you want, you can write them down and look them up. And I'm just going to briefly touch on each one. Isaiah 11, 1 through 6. We have a picture of the prophet grasping in a moment from God, not only the divinity of Jesus coming as a suffering servant, but also him coming as a king and reigning and ruling on the earth where the lion will lay down with the lamb, where there will be complete peace, where there will be no more war. In Psalm 2, we have a picture of the end times with the kings of the earth and the rulers of the earth raging against God, saying, we will reject you. We will establish our own kingdom. We will throw off all constraint. And God sits in heaven and laughs. Ha! you got to be kidding me. I have a king, and I've established him on my holy hill. And you better bow down to him and kiss the sun, lest the rock fall upon you. Jesus will return. He will take over. The Father has promised him the nations as an inheritance. And when he returns, when he deposes of the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan is cast into uh, uh, the lake of fire, when he returns and establishes his kingdom, he will rule and reign, the scripture says, on the earth for a thousand years. And you and I will rule and reign with him during that time. Psalm 45 and Psalm 110 are messianic psalms where David had revelation of Jesus returning as a king. And the revelation is of a beautiful man. Psalm 45 says that he's fairer than the sons of men. It gives us description of Jesus that is so beautiful, so fair, that when his people see him, they fall in love with him. And they say, we want you. We are on your side. We will go to war with you. We will stand with you. Psalm 110 gives the same picture of Jesus coming back and returning. And it says that in that day, his volunteers will gladly give their lives because of the beauty of their king. Beloved, we haven't, we, we, we tasted this much. I mean, literally, we have tasted this much. If you could imagine all the sands of the sea of Pismo Beach, if you could just take one single grain, we might come close to having an idea of how much of God there is and how much we've grasped. Paul said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared and laid up for those who love him. Revelation 11:15 says that they will rejoice because the kingdoms of the earth have now become the kingdoms of God. Jesus will rule on the earth. Every king will bow. Every nation will submit. Kings will bring their treasures. They will worship him. They will adore him. They will honor him as all submit to him as a beautiful, wonderful, conquering king. And we will rule and reign with him. There will be no more tears. There will be no more sickness. There will be no more brokenness. There will be no more sorrow. There will be no more regret. Can you imagine that? 
Can you imagine living in this radiant, beautiful, wonderful peace where your body never hurts, your body never gets tired? I mean, I understand tiredness. I'm still getting over jet lag. I'm doing pretty well, except for falling asleep every day around seven for an hour. I don't know what that's about yet. My body's coming back. But it will be a day where there is no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain. But beyond that, it's not just about, oh, gee, here I am, now I feel good. Whatever your purpose is in life, whatever passion burns in you now, whatever you love to do right now, you will be doing that with Jesus during the millennial reign. Isaiah says that we will rebuild the ancient cities. If you're an architect, you're going to love it. <laughs> Jesus is going to call you in. Hey, this is what I'm thinking about the rebuilding of a Royal Grande, or if you've got bigger things in mind, maybe New York City or maybe Hong Kong. We will rebuild the ancient ruins. There will be agriculture. There will be ranching. There will be farming. Isaiah says that the rivers will flow from the mountains, that the earth will be replenished, that you will have your place where you water your cattle and, and, and where you grow your food. I mean, there's just going to be the, uh, the best way I could describe it, and we really don't have a, a good picture of this, is the garden before Adam and Eve sinned and multiply it by a million. I mean, we will just live, rule, reign with God. Whatever's in your heart, Jesus will speak to that. It'll be multiplied. We will rule and reign with him. He will set us in place. What is in us will come out to the max of our joy and to his joy. Whatever potential you have tasted now, whatever dream you have dreamed now will be in its fullness when Jesus sets you in those places. It's just going to be awesome. There will be no war. There will be no fighting. There will be... No enemy to try to oppress you or tempt you. It will just be total freedom, living in Jesus, enjoying his love, walking in the fullness of that. There will be festivals. There will be celebrations. There will be times when we will all go to Zion. The scripture says, out of Zion, Jesus will teach the word. Can you imagine that? We will go in our new bodies to Zion and have a Bible study with Jesus? Wow. Talk about revelation, you know. The Word is going to teach us the Word. Every nation will fulfill its destiny. Every city will fulfill its purpose. Every believer will will fulfill their complete potential in God. But what I like better than that is I get to walk up to Jesus and I get to put my finger in the nail prints of his hand. to lay my head on his breast. And I get to finally have words that I can't find in this life to express my love and my gratitude and my thanksgiving for what he's done for me and for who he is. The one that I have loved, the one that I have served for over 50 years the one who has caught my tears in his bottle, the one who has healed me when I've been sick, the one who has delivered me when I've been oppressed and in trial and trouble, the one who has rejoiced my soul when I've stood in his presence and he's touched me and I've wept and I've laughed, the one I've come to know as friend who's walked with me through the valley of the shadow of death. I will get to see him face to face, eye to eye his fiery eyes of love, just looking right through me, right into me. No shame, no guilt, no tribulation, no trouble. I think that'll be good for the first 10,000 years. <laughs> Maybe more. It's important for us to understand that there's way, 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 way more than this life. 
And so often, I, I think the church today has lost that context. And everything is about now, getting everything now, trying to get everything now, trying to have as much as we can now, try to lay hold of this now, as if it was ours to possess. Beloved, we're not buying houses, we're living in campgrounds. And I'm not against buying a house. I'm, I'm just saying, there's nothing that we get to take with us. You'll never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. It won't happen. There is purpose for where we are going and for what we are doing right now when we understand an eternal context. When we understand this life isn't all there is. And I'm not, you know, kicking out this life and saying, you know, be glum and be depressed and, and just, you know, walk through this thing in some kind of ascetic. I got to go out there and be a hermit and hide myself from the world. I'm not talking about that kind of gloom. I love Teresa of Avila. She said, Lord, deliver us from gloomy saints. So I'm not talking about gloom, but I am talking about finding joy and peace in life in the midst of what we go through because we know where we're going. Jesus said, in this world you'll have tribulation, but don't be afraid, I've overcome the world. There's a strength, there's a life, there's a joy in us because we know where we're heading. We know what the end result is. We know what the end game is. And so that affects how we live. The reason why God gave you the Holy Spirit, why he gave me the Holy Spirit, is a down payment, Paul says, of what's to come. In Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 2, it says, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of God as a down payment of the promise of the kingdom that's coming. That's why you find a restlessness in any other place, because nothing can satisfy outside of a life in Jesus. You can put your hope in a job, you can put your hope in a relationship, you can put your hope in a ministry, in a person, in a church, and you will be disappointed over and over and over again. It's also why there's a cry in you that rises up that you can't always give words to or can't understand, but you have this, this heavenward GPS that's placed in your heart that's always pulling you upward. It's that Holy Spirit in us that's longing for home. It's that Holy Spirit in us that's telling us, okay, it's good, seek me, follow me, be in my word, I will pour out my spirit, but know this, I'm taking you upward. And Jesus wants to take us home more than we want to be there. Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Father, I want them to be with me where I am. Abba says in, in, in the Psalms, he said, how precious, David had the revelation, how precious to God is the death of his beloved ones. While we miss them when they go, God rejoices to receive his beloved ones home. It's his desire. It's his heart. It's, it's, it's the end game. None of us are going to live forever unless Jesus comes back. And then we're still going to undergo a major transformation. You know, talk about a makeover. We have the Holy Spirit in us to testify that these things are true. Every touch of Jesus that you sense or feel is a reminder of what's coming. If you have an encounter with Jesus, it's not just that, oh, Jesus loves me and I'm being refreshed. If you have an encounter with Jesus, the Holy Spirit is saying to you, this is what it's like up there all the time. The Holy Spirit is saying, this is what it's like in my presence all the time. I'm just reminding you, I'm refreshing you, I'm, I'm touching you so you have a hunger, you have a taste, you have a desire to touch and know and be with me in that place. Every healing, it's just a manifestation reminding us that there's no sickness in heaven. Every physical, emotional restoration is a reminder to us that in that place, there will be no need for any of this. It all gives context. Every prayer we pray, every little word, every little touch, every little uh, reach upward, we are tasting eternity. We are stepping into a moment of eternity of what it's going to be like forever in the presence of Jesus. Oh, isn't that good? That's why I love the touch of the Holy Spirit in my life. I mean, I love it for me because I need it, you know? I get broken. I get weak. I get weary. I need the Holy Spirit. I need Jesus to manifest his love to me in his word and in his spirit. But I love the reminder, you know, 
I'm walking through this with you. I'm walking this journey with you. I, I mentioned that scripture in Psalm 56. The Lord says, I know your journey. I know you're traveling. And I've caught all your tears in my bottle. And I will fight your enemies and turn them away from you. Jesus knows our journey. He knows us. He knows how we walk and what we need. And he comes to us to strengthen us and to remind us, don't give up. There's more. Don't give up. There's something on the other side. Don't give up. There's something more than you can imagine that's going on. So with this in mind, that's all the introduction. <laughs> I am going to talk about <laughs> three places that this reality gives value and context to in our lives. In the first place that having this heavenly context gives value to is the place of prayer. Prayer, intimacy with God, worship, whether it's singing, praying, corporate, or individual, prayer is ground zero for the kingdom of heaven. When I pray, when I talk to God, I'm not just saying, well, gee, I think we should have a nice prayer meeting, have some nice music, and, and, and feel good. I'm saying there's a kingdom up there that's going to come down here. And my prayer is valuable to God because the purpose of my prayer and my intercession is to see that happen. That's why it says in Revelation 21, the spirit and the bride say, come, Lord Jesus. And it's just not just because we want to see Jesus, but when the king comes, the kingdom comes. And when the kingdom comes, there's healing, there's restoration, there's salvation. When the kingdom comes, there's fullness, there's joy, there's life. And so in the context of prayer, particularly corporate prayer, particularly intercession, what we are doing is we are engaging in the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. When I'm crying out, when I'm praying for this region, when I'm praying for salvation, when I'm praying for campuses, when I'm praying for the saints' hearts to come alive with the fire of love and the fire of joy, when I'm crying out for a spirit of revelation to be on the central coast and our nation and the nations of the earth, when I'm asking God to touch my friends in Poland and Germany and the Ukraine and England and different places in the earth, it's not a nice gesture. I am asking God to take what he promised he would bring and release it into his life and to release it into those nations and there's power and there's value in that the value in the context is Jesus said pray like this let the kingdom come when Jesus came we received the measure of the kingdom when Jesus came he said the kingdom of God is in your midst and there is a measure of the kingdom that has been released that's why we love to pray for the sick because Jesus brought healing we love to see the oppressed set free because Jesus cast out demons and set them free. We love to see the broken restored because Jesus came to open the prison gates and to let the oppressed go out. He came today, right now, in this moment, to give an exchange of beauty for ashes, to give an exchange of oppression for freedom, to give an exchange of weeping for joy. He came to do these things in the here and now. They're all marks that the kingdom actually has come. But the fullness of the kingdom has yet to come. The fullness of the kingdom doesn't come until the king returns. But the way the scripture teaches us to cry out for the return of the king is in the place of prayer. It is in the place of me sitting before him. And I don't have to feel wonderful, great, beautiful, anointed, or anything to do that. I can sit before him and, you know, our, our Tuesday night team will tell you this. We've, we've had debriefings where we had rough nights. It was a hard prayer meeting. But you know what? It doesn't matter if it's a hard prayer meeting. God doesn't grade it that way. God smiles and says, you showed up and your weak prayers moved my heart. It's not about your strength. It's not about your anointing. It's not about your skill level. It's not about how much you know or how eloquent you can pray. It's about this weak heart on the inside saying, I'm longing for something more. And that something more is the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to cry out as much as I know how for that kingdom to come to earth because I know that there's context to it. Whether you're sitting in the prayer room or whether you're sitting in your living room, it's this cry, it's ground zero for the kingdom of heaven. It's that thing in your inner man, in your inner heart that just says, I know there's more and I long for more. And it's the revelation of Jesus. It's a revelation of the beauty of Jesus. 
Knowing where we're going gives context to prayer. It gives value to the prayer meeting. It gives value to the fact that I'm showing up. I might not feel like it. I might be tired. It might have been a long day. Everything that could go wrong probably went wrong, but I'm showing up. I'm coming. I'm going to join my voice with the voices of others, weak as we may be, and ask God to bring heaven to earth. And ask God to release his power and his glory for our region. Because our region, why, belongs to Jesus. If God the Father gives Jesus nations in Psalm 2 as his inheritance, how much easier is it for him to give him a city? A royal grande is your inheritance, Jesus. Five cities is your inheritance, Jesus. The central coast is your inheritance, Jesus. It's yours. It belongs to you. Mayors will come. <laughs> and give you their treasures. <laughs> City councilmen will come and worship at your feet. Yeah. It's what makes prayer make sense, besides the fact that we just love Jesus and like to be with him. That's first and foremost. I like to pray because I like to be with Jesus. It's where I get to taste eternity. It's where I get to know that I'm his favorite. You can all fight it out for number two. <laughs> Amen. I guess I'm not his favorite. <sighs> the little children, of course. So prayer is the first context. It makes it make sense. We understand that. It's why we do that prayer room. You may or may not be aware of this, but over the last 15 to 20 years, the Lord has been raising up a prayer movement, a global prayer movement, all over the earth. If you Google House of Prayer, you would be amazed at not only around the world, but in our nation, how many House of Prayer have sprung up over the last 10, 15 years. God is raising up a global prayer movement to cry out to him to come back. He's raising up a global prayer movement of lovers, of laid down lovers and worshipers. He's calling in anointed and skilled singers and intercessors and musicians and worshipers in these last days to cry out for the kingdom to come. He's doing it all across the nations. What, one of the things that I love, and you never know when you go to another nation what it's going to be like. One of the things that I have loved about being in Poland is they've got musicians that are skilled, that are lovers of Jesus, and they know how to do this thing. They know how to cry out to God. In 2009, the first time I went, I, I visited with two friends there who were planning houses of prayer. Now there's five houses of prayer in Poland. And most of the, and this may not make sense to a lot of you, but most of these have the blessing of the bishops and the, the priests of higher rank in major cities that are saying, hey, church, do this. We're behind these guys. We're with these guys. We know the necessity of prayer. That's why we do the prayer room. And I know our staff doesn't look at it this way, but I, I just want to say that it, that's not a department over there. It's not a side ministry over there. We are raising up Voices House of Prayer because we are engaged in bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. We are doing Voices House of Prayer because we are engaged in seeing the age to come manifest now. And my prayer, I'm not overdoing this, God can only do something like this, is to see night and day worship. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. As the Lord brings people in, and some of you are the people that he's going to bring in, I'm prophesying that. <laughs> We're going to continue to build prayer meetings and to build prayer. Why? Because it's valuable to God. It moves his heart. And I'm not talking, you know, that this image of intercessors who carry some kind of heavy anointing, and, and in every moment they're in touch with what's happening in the universe. I don't really know anybody like that. I know a lot of tired people who work all day and show up and pray. I know a lot of people who just say, I, I feel this call in my heart, so I'm going to go for it. It's about that call, that cry, that understanding that this is bigger than 
me. And church, we need a revelation, and that's why there is an end-time context that gives us a, a revelation that this whole thing is bigger than us. It's not just about me. It's not just about me getting what I want in this lifetime. It's about me touching someone who has eyes of fire, who is a glorious king who's going to return and establish his kingdom on the earth one day, and I want to be so in love with him that I don't care what my part is. I don't care if I'm scrubbing toilets or I'm preaching the gospel. The pay's the same. When we are in love with Jesus. So it gives context to prayer. <laughs> okay, I have like three minutes. <sighs> It also gives context to our love and our service. Because when I understand that Jesus is returning and what I do honors him, then it makes a difference in why I do what I do. You can serve without loving, but you cannot love without serving. You can serve to gain notoriety. You can serve to be recognized. You can serve to be promoted. You can serve to manipulate. You can serve for a lot of reasons. But if you are in love with Jesus and you know he's returning and you want his blessing and you want his signature on everything we're doing, then what we do, we do with an excellent spirit. There's a judgment seat of Christ that every believer will stand before. Paul references it twice, once in 1 Corinthians and once in 2 Corinthians. He says we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the rewards for what we did in this body. Now, this is not a judgment about salvation. We are all saved. It's not about that, but there will be a day that we will be rewarded for how we live this life. Paul says every man's work will be tested by the fire. And if the work survives, then he will be recorded, re rewarded. If the work doesn't survive, he will still go to heaven. This kind of says by the skin of his teeth. But he'll make it. We will receive eternal rewards for what we do in this life. We will be rewarded, though everything we do will be tested by fire. Now, to me, that fire is love. Jesus, in Revelation 1, sees us through eyes of fiery love. He's jealous over us. He loves us. So what it means, at least in my understanding, is that when we understand who we are to him and where we are going, and we understand the mercy that we have received and the grace and the love that we have received, then we cannot help but give our lives in service to other people whether it's in the church, whether it's in the community, whatever it is, we cannot help but serve because we're in love. If I'm doing it for any other reason, the fire is going to consume that. If I'm doing what I do for my own reward, my own gain, my own purposes, to be recognized or whatever else, the fire is going to consume those motives, so I'm still going to get to go to heaven. But when we serve in love, when we give ourselves in love, when we lay our lives down in love for the family of God, for Jesus, for his purposes in the earth, beloved, we're going to receive rewards. I don't know what it looks like. I do know this. If somebody gets more rewards than you, you won't be jealous. That's why we get to practice now. Paul said rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. If your brother is given a... $80,000 Mercedes Benz, rejoice with him. I'm so happy for you. When the monthly payment comes around, you can weep with him. <laughs> <laughs> there will be no jealousy. There will be no envy. There will only be like, like, oh, I'm so glad you got more than me. Oh, because I knew you. I saw it. I mean, we think, you know, the guys that are going to get the big rewards are the mega preachers and the mega churches and doing the big things. You know, I, I think a lot of the biggest rewards are going to go out to those mothers who are closet prayer warriors crying out for their children. And... <laughs> Happy Mother's Day early. <laughs> for those who gave themselves without any public attention, nobody saw, nobody knew, nobody understood what they did, but they gave themselves completely to God in the secret place, like Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, do your works in secret and God will reward you publicly. But I do know that nobody's going to be jealous. 
But what I do today matters in terms of connection to the end times. The labor that I do today, how I love people, how I share the gospel, how I keep my word, how I stay faithful, how when I say I'm going to do this, I do it. How when I say I'm going to show up, I show up. How I say when I'm going to give, I really honor that and I give the way that I said I'm going to give. All those things are important to Jesus in the long-range context. And if I understand that, and it inspires me in my faithfulness. It inspires me in my love. It inspires me to keep saying yes to Jesus day in, day out. And then you don't burn out. You get tired, but you don't burn out because we know that there's something else coming. Every cup of cold water will be rewarded. Every cup of cold water that you give in secret will be rewarded. It changes how we see people. When we know where we're going and we've received the mercy and the love of God, it changes how I see my city. You know, a lot of churches only see their church. They don't see their city. A lot of churches only see what they're trying to do as a church and trying to accomplish as a church, but they don't see the city that they're in. One of the things I love about every day is we're trying to do that. We're trying to address justice. We're trying to understand how to touch, transform an entire city. But when we, as the people of God, represent the beauty of God, we beautify our city by loving Jesus. We make our city more beautiful by loving and serving Jesus and standing in that place because we understand what it's all about. And we want the people in the city to know Jesus. We want them standing on that ocean with us. We want them standing and looking at Jesus with us, our loved ones, our family, the people we work with. We want them there with us on that day. And so we love, we labor for that experience of seeing them come into the kingdom. We see the city as God's city. And then we as a church take our place as a city on a hill where they can see the works and the love of Jesus. Last context. Having an eternal perspective gives value to our suffering and our struggle. There's not a person in this room that hasn't struggled or isn't struggling with something. There's not a person in this room who hasn't faced difficulties or trials. If you're parents, you really know what I'm talking about. There's not a person in this room who hasn't experienced some disappointment, some heartache, some hope deferred, where you haven't at some point said, you know what, I don't know if it's worth it. I just want to give up. It's just too hard. I just want to quit. I want to throw up my hands. I'm tired of it. Some of you have struggled with an area of sin over and over and over again. You've said, oh, I hate this, but I do it. I hate this, but I do it. I'm just so done. Jesus, how can you even still love me? When we have an in context, when we know what our end is, it gives us strength for the struggle. That our struggle is not without purpose. David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. You are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Why? Because Jesus already walked through the valley of the shadow of death. He knows the way. He knows how to walk with us in the middle of our struggle. He knows how to come alongside of us and say, I know, I know, I know. I feel it with you. I'm watching you. I'm with you in this struggle. I'm not pushing you away from you, from me. I'm, I'm pulling you close to me. I'm not separating you out. I'm not mad at you. I'm not angry at you. I'm actually reaching my hand out to give you a hiding place. I want to be your rock. I want to be your shelter. I want to be your anchor in the veil. I want to walk you through this to show you my goodness. And when we understand that really life is not about major events, life is actually a journey all the way into the kingdom of heaven, then we can understand how he walks with us in our journey and how our struggles are redeemed, how our faith will be rewarded on that day, how our hope will be rewarded on that day so that we can continue to have hope. That's why the, the, the return of Jesus is referred to in the scriptures as the blessed hope. We have this hope that he will return, that he will bring justice, that he will make wrong things right, that he will hear our cry, and he'll change things today, which is part of why we pray, but those things that we try and try and try and try, and whatever reason they don't seem to change yet, they will have context, and we will overcome them. 
I have a 100% healing rate when I pray for the sick. A lot of them get healed this side, but they'll all get healed that side. You know? When we understand the depth of his grace, the depth of his love, when we understand the cross, this is why he came, so that I could stand with him on that sea. This is why he gave his life, so that I could be redeemed from my sin and my brokenness. And on that, on, on that day, look into his eyes and look into his face and know that it was worth it. It gives context to what I'm going through right now. It gives me faith for the things that are too big for me, which, if we're honest, are most things. The things I can handle myself, I don't need faith for. It's those things that are out of my control. And you know, control is an illusion. Whatever we think, control is an illusion. You can make your plan. I'm going to leave my house today, 8 a.m. I'll be at work at 8.15, and all it takes is one traffic jam and three red lights to totally blow your control. But understanding that our lives belong to God, understanding that he's in control and that it'll be worth it on that day. It will be worth it on that day to have stayed, to have loved, to have hung in, to have thrown our hands up in the air and said, I give up again, Jesus. It's bigger than me. I give up again, Lord. It's bigger than I am. I give up again, Lord. It's bigger than what I can handle. It gives context to him coming alongside and saying, yeah, I know, I know, I got you. Come to me. If you're weary and heavy laden, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Cast all your cares on me. I care for you. And guess what? It's a short time. Just a short time and you'll be with me. In a minute, you'll be standing before me. In a minute, you'll be in my presence. In a minute, every broken thing will be redeemed. Every hurt will be healed. In a minute, everything lost will be restored. In a minute, everything that was unjust will be made just. In a minute, you will be vindicated. Your love will be rewarded. It will be worth it. Gives us context. Amen. All right. Well, I just like really went over here. So let's just close our eyes and blame it on jet lag. Well, Lord, I just ask that you give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Jesus. Jesus, that we would know you more right where we are. That our hearts and lives would grow in the context of being loved by you and of loving you. And I just pray this morning, Father, for people in this room, however you've touched them, Holy Spirit, whatever you have touch them with in a variety of ways. Lord, perhaps you, you, you've touched some with a, a burning desire, a spirit of prayer that, that says, I, I want to give myself to that. I want to pour myself out before you, Lord, to see your kingdom come. Maybe others, Lord, that you've touched in the context of service that say this morning, because you love me, I want to give myself away. I want to lay it down. I'm yours. It's not about my life. It's about your life. It's not about what I get. It's about what I get to give you. And Lord, for some today who just might be going through some struggles, who have just said to themselves, even this morning, I just feel like giving up. This is too big for me. I can't handle, I can't control this, Jesus. For some who have struggled with areas over and over and over again, who felt like giving up, shame, guilt, condemnation. Whatever the Holy Spirit put his finger on during this time of sharing, Holy Spirit, I ask right now, would you just come and manifest that? Manifest that to our hearts. For those who are crying out for prayer, release a spirit of prayer, release a fire, a burning spirit to pray, to worship, a spirit of intercession, a spirit of burning, Lord, that our hearts would burn with your heart, that our hearts would burn to see the kingdom of heaven come, even today, even tonight, even tomorrow. We just say, have your way, Lord. Do in us what you want to do. Do in us what, we want, what you want to do. We are yours. 
We are yours. We are yours. Amen.